Hey guys, hope you're having a great Saturday so far. Um, I just want to give you a warning real quick. We're trying to get our security system fixed. So if you hear an alarm go off, don't panic. Uh, my husband is amazing and he's working on that and getting the bugs worked out. So praise God for those that didn't know, we got our, our house got hit by lightning several weeks ago. And so we've had a lot of um, electrical damage in the house and things that we've been trying to fix. And uh, we're in contact with the insurance company and blah, blah, blah. Anyway. That's not why I'm doing this live. So I really debated on doing this live because I know this is going to be um, a controversial topic for people. Um, I doubt I'll have a whole lot of people tune into this, but it's okay. Um, and uh, this is something that I've really spent some time looking into, um, reading and doing some research. And um, I've come on today because I have some serious concerns about inner healing. And I want to address those and um, talk with you and I want to have open dialogue. So I'm not gonna pay a lot of attention to the comments so much right now because I have a lot of ground to cover. But if you have questions, if you have disagreements, hey Kimberly, um, with me, please private message me and let me know um, and feel free to, um, to contact me about it. I'm gonna share some scripture with you at the end, but I want to be honest and let you know because some people don't realize what inner healing is. They have no idea where the roots of this come from. Hey, Aaron, um, I understand that I may lose friends because of this. Um, people may get upset with me about it, but we need to know the truth and not fall into deception. My concern with inner healing is it's not biblically based, um, that it actually is new age based, um, that it's based in roots that are not scripturally related, that they branch into other religions and things, as we're going to talk about here in a minute. So. Why am I talking about inner healing? Because there's a lot of Christians that are getting entrapped, I believe, into inner healing, and they're not understanding that Jesus, and the word is sufficient for one thing, the word of God is sufficient, and what Jesus did on the cross for us is sufficient. Um, and so we need to understand that. It doesn't mean we're not gonna go through things, it doesn't mean that we're not going to battle things in our life, it doesn't mean that we don't deal with emotions. Hey Joyce, but um, it does mean that um, we are going to deal with things in our life and that Jesus, the answers that we have to seek are in the scriptures. And they're in uh, us being indwelt by the Holy Spirit and being empowered by the Holy Spirit to live holy and consecrated lives unto God, to glorify Him, and to walk things out. Um, and people are going to say, well, who are you to say such things? Um, how, how do you know where this came from? Well, let me tell you. So I have three books here. Um, Agnes Sanford is the pioneer of inner healing. You may or may not have ever heard her name, but you're going to hear it today, and you're going to hear a lot of stuff that she said. I've actually taken the time over the past months to read two books by her. This is the first book she wrote in 1947. It's called The Healing Light. These books that she wrote were in Christian bookstores, and I'm here to tell you they have no business being in Christian bookstores. As you're going to hear things that are quoted from this book, I took the time to read these books I just finished one up yesterday. The second one uh, I read, she wrote several books. She died in 1982. Um, the second book she wrote, uh, not the second, but one of the ones I read was The Healing Gifts of the Spirit. I'm going to st share quotes with you in just a few minutes from these books, and you can judge for yourself whether or not this is stuff that needs to be in Christian bookstores. She is the pioneer and the root of inner healing. Um, John and Paula Sandford, with a D, um, they actually credit her in their books as the pioneer of inner healing. She was their mentor. Um, and as you're going to see, the roots of this are not biblical. Okay. I pray that she found Jesus before she died because the things that she says in her books, it really was disturbing to me. And then I also read the Sozo book. This is from Bethel. Um, this is rooted in inner healing again from Agnes Sanford. So things like theophostic prayer, um, Sozo, the inner healing, this is all rooted, the original root of this is from Agnes Sanford. And you need to know that name because she's mentioned in passing when you read some of this stuff. Like I've actually been on uh, Bethel's website, I've even read some of the stuff about divine editing. Um, that's an advanced teaching of Sozo and they credit, in the divine editing from Bethel, they credit Agnes Sanford for this. This is disturbing. And this is, you're going to hear why. So what you may not know about inner healing. So just buckle up. Don't get offended at me. Take off your offense ears or your offense hat. And just please listen for a few minutes because I'm saying this in love. I don't know everything, but I took enough time. I took several months to read these books, to research. And I want to share this with you because 
If I know these things and I know them to not be true as a Christian, then I am responsible for sharing that with other believers so that that way they don't fall into deception and follow another Christ that cannot save, okay? So inner healing is the healing of memories. That is the main belief of that is, inner, is the healing of memories. Agnes Sanford is the mother of inner healing. You will hear several people if you read their books. Um, Ruth Carter, St Carter Stapleton, she was the sister of Jimmy Carter. That's an example. Um, she followed Agnes Sanford. Several people did. Uh, Norman Vincent Peale. Um, several people that are well known followed Agnes Sanford's teaching of inner healing. She has been referred to as the pioneer of inner healing. Um, this is the root of theophostic prayer and sozo, um, which is the healing of memories. Again, this is what this is referred to as the healing of memories. I'm going to be going fast and I'm because I got a lot of stuff to cover because I, I spent type, uh, time typing this up and then I'm going to show you scripture as to why we don't need to be doing this. Um, she grew up in China. Agnes grew up in China um, and she had missionary parents and her parents... Um, um, ascribed to biblical teaching um, and but this was not a this was apparently not sufficient enough for her so even in other books that she wrote there's one book called sealed orders um, I have not read that one but I've seen quotes from it she um, actually dabbled in was influenced by the Tao which is the force that's in Chinese that has to do with yin and yang she admits that she admits when she was 11 years old to going into a Buddhist temple and praying to Buddha and even in that book she quotes that she believes that demons entered her at that time and that she was even, ha they even had demons cast out of her as an adult. Um, I cannot remember the source, but I remember reading somewhere several months ago that John Sanford um, had even allegedly had admitted that she, that he had cast demons out of her um, and that she was possessed with the demon before she wrote The Healing Light and that he cast demons out of her in 1962 or 63. Mind you, she wrote The Healing Light in 1947. Again, this is the root of inner healing. I agree, John. Sozo is dangerous. And I'm going to show you why some of this stuff is. And you need to test it against Scripture. Not go against, not believe just what I'm telling you. But you need to search this out for yourself and be sure. Because I'm telling you right now, as Christians, we're getting so wrapped up in everything that else is going on and masks and everything else. And I understand we need to pay attention. But we have things going on in the church that are dangerous and they're not biblical and we are getting led astray. And I'm sounding a warning to you guys, a clarion call right now to please, please, please don't just please search this stuff out and don't get wrapped up in it because it is dangerous stuff. You're going to be led astray. Um, hey, Lori, good to see you. So what did Agnes believe? She held to the belief that God is a force and a power of visualization. She talked of being made ill by negative vibrations. I'm going to read some of that here in a minute from her book. Um, healing self and others through positive vibrations. So my question is, what is the point of praying to God and asking for healing if we can heal ourselves through vibrations? I'm, that's just a question. I mean, I can't ask her that because she's dead, but as you'll see, she also ascribes to being able to contact people that are dead. You'll see that in a minute. So the basic teaching of inner healing is this. It's salvation and healing come through uprooting negative memories that are buried in the subconscious dictating our behavior. This is based in psychology. Um, she also was heavily influenced by Carl Jung, I think, or Jung, J-U-N-G, um, which he was a psychologist. He was a Swedish psychologist that specialized in the subconscious. He believed that you um, that there were these buried memories, like in psychology, that could be uprooted, that could be dealt with. Um, this is very dangerous things to be dabbling in. Even in the 80s with psychology, there were people that um, filed lawsuits because they falsely accused family members of sexual molestation. That never happened. Um, there are memories that are created, these false memories that are recreated that never took place, and then it damages families, it breaks up homes, it breaks marriages, and it damages people even more. So she believed that salvation and healing came through uprooting negative memories buried in the subconscious dictating our behavior. There is a focus on being wronged by others rather than self. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit, but the Bible makes it clear, even in the Old Testament in Ezekiel 18, that we are responsible for our own sins, our own transgressions. Yes, people can wrong us, but ultimately we are responsible. We don't pay for the iniquities of our fathers, we, and the fathers don't pay for the iniquities of their sons. Um, Visualization is used to recreate the past event. This is a new age occultic practice. Sorry. This is a new age practice. We'll give it just a second. Sorry, I warned you. 
We're trying to get our sound, our alarm system fixed. Thank you. Okay. So Jesus is brought in as a spirit guide to sanctify the memory, forgive the person, and even alter the reality of the memory in order to deliver them from the traumatic event and diseased memory. No, <laughs> no, 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 guys. No, we don't need, we don't need to do that. There's no need to do that. And never are we told in scripture to visualize things. That is a new age occultic practice. We don't do that. Um, the memory is recreated. And Jesus is called upon to affirm or encourage. The problem is with this is Jesus cannot be called upon to do things like this. We can't be, we can't commit we can't command Jesus to come. We can't tell him to come. That is not scriptural. That is creating another Christ another Jesus that cannot save us. And then these people are going through this constant thing of, I have to have, I have to be sozoed all the time. I have to have inner healing all the time. No, you don't. You need to have a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Realize that you're a sinner saved by grace, that you are in a fleshly tent that is going to be hostile to the things of the spirit, according to the book of Romans, and that you are walking out your, um, you're walking out your faith with fear and trembling, working out your salvation with fear and trembling. This and trusting in the Lord all the way. Um, her mentor was Pastor Morton Kelsey, an Episcopal priest. She was under, uh, she went to an Episcopal church. She was also a Universalist, um, as we'll see in just a minute. She, um, this man, Morton Kelsey, studied at the Jung Institute. Again, he was a Swedish um, psychologist that studied in, in um, psychoanalysis, I believe. And he became, this, this priest became a Jungian psychologist. Where are we supposed to do this? I don't know. Um, he said to have communicated with and had guidance from the dead. Now, this is in a book that he actually wrote. I don't know the book in front of me, but I saw several quotes from this. Um, he equated shamanistic powers with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. If, if anybody else is, is already disturbed by what you're hearing, I certainly hope you are. Because as I start to read things here in just a minute from this first book, The Healing Light, and I'll tell you what I did. Um... I love to read. I'm an avid reader. Read. I'm an avid reader. No, I'm an avid reader. And I found this site uh, about a year or two ago called thriftbooks.com. If you like to read, this is an excellent, I don't get anything from this. So I'm just telling you about it. Um, it's an excellent website to check out. You can find used books there, very cheap, um, and not have to pay the full price for them. Plus, when I started researching things, um, like this and other things I've researched. I'll probably do other videos and other things too that'll probably upset people. But listen, we've got to be in the truth right now. We can't be getting in the in in this stuff. This is this is madness. Um, you know, we want to fix the world and the church has got people that are professing to be Christians are eating this stuff up. And you're listening to demons of doc, uh, doc, doctrines of demons is what you're doing. Um, quite frankly, and I know again people get upset with me about that, but this is not rooted in scripture. Nowhere is this rooted in scripture. Um, Agnes Sanford wrote The Healing Light. I found this on thrift books. I found the other two on thrift books um, because I, want, I wanted to get them cheaper. And frankly, I did not want to pay those ministries for their books um, and give them uh, financial credit for it. But I have these and I have written in them like research only, like right there. So I keep them for research purposes. Okay, so quotes from The Healing Light. Let's dive into this. And I hope you're still with me. I'm going to... I'm try I've got a lot to cover, so if you want to listen to me, you can. Hey, Sean, good to see you. Um, you can either listen to me or you can tune me out. You can block me. You can unfriend me. You can unfollow me. You can do whatever you want. It's okay. It's still a free country up until this point. Um, so quotes from The Healing Light. Let's see. Um, the name of some books, Lisa. Um, this first one is The Healing Light by Agnes Sanford. Again, Agnes Sanford is quoted as and known as being the pioneer of inner healing. This is why you need to stay away from inner healing. Inner healing is not rooted in scripture. It's not. And I love you enough to tell you the truth. Um, the other book that I read of her, she's written, she wrote several books. She died in 1982. Um, the Healing Gifts of the Spirit. I'm going to read some quotes for both of these books. Um, I don't have any quotes from Sozo, this book from Bethel, but just enough to read in here. Like it says that Jesus apologized and said he was sorry for things. Jesus has no reason to apologize for anything, nor do we. does God need our forgiveness for anything because God cannot sin. He is incapable of sin. He is incapable of lying. He is incapable of temptation. If you have a vision come to you, if you've been Sozoed or whatever, and I've actually, um, when I read through this, I realized that 
um, someone had actually, I think, done he inner healing with me, um, I rejected it. Once I realized what happened, I rejected it because I don't need to visualize Jesus. That is idolatry. We do not need to create a false image of Jesus. And we don't know if that's Jesus coming to us or not. And the last time I checked, Jesus is sitting, sitting on the throne at the right hand of the Father. He ain't coming down in capri pants or culottes or whatever, shorts and, and flip-flops and talking to people like that, okay? You need to test the spirits. Test them, please. Quotes from the healing light. Let's get, let's get into this. this. These are things Agnes Sanford said, the, the pioneer of healing, of inner healing. The kingdom of God is within you, said Jesus. And some of these things sound like, okay, that sounds biblical. And it is the indwelling light, the secret place of the consciousness of the Most High, there's that word consciousness, that is the kingdom of heaven in its present manifestation on this earth. Now, some of that sounds good, but, but when you're talking about Christ consciousness, that's new age. And Christ consciousness, just to let you know, there are people like Richard Rohr that teach this today. Um, and there are well-known ministers that you'll come across that are quoting Richard Rohr. And I don't know if they know what they're doing or not, but they are endorsing these people that are saying Christ consciousness is, is simply the belief that Jesus, the man, went up to heaven, but Christ stayed on the earth. They separate the Messiah from the... Do you see what I'm saying here? No, that's, that's not the same Christ. God does nothing except by law. Again, these are all quotes from her book, The, the Healing Light. When speaking of a man who was sick that she was to pray for, who was still ill, she quotes, At this point, Satan entered me, and I began to wonder whether it was God's will for him to die. She said, we are the electric light bulbs through whom the light of God reaches the world. Thus, we are part God. No, we are not. We are not little gods. We are not. Don't let anybody tell you that. It is not biblical. They are taking scripture out of context. That's from Psalm 82. I believe it's Psalm 82. That Jesus said, we are not little gods. We are not part God. Okay? Okay. She says, when ministering to a man with a broken bone who was not a Christian, this is what she said to him. This was in this book. I'm not making it up. Read it for yourself if you want. She told this man, ask that something come into you. Just say, whoever you are, whatever you are, come into me now and help nature in my body to mend this bone and do it quick. What? Whatever, whoever you are or whatever you are, come into me now. That sounds like you're inviting a devil into your body. No, ma'am. Her summary of the prayer of faith was this. Choose the same time and the same place every day. Make yourself comfortable and relax. Remind yourself of the reality of a life outside yourself. Ask that life to come in and increase life in your body. Make a picture in your mind of your body well. Visualization is a new age in occult practice, by the way. How easy this becomes when we know that our bodies are made of his own energy and full of his own light. Energy, light. These are like red flag words um, that are used in the New Age occultic practice. She said the love vibrations and the faith vibrations of God enter through our thoughts of life and love. In the same way, destructive thought vibrations of Satan enter through our thoughts of illness, hate, and death. She said, Jesus did not contend with Satan. He merely turned his back on him. In doing so, he lived so far above evil that he was able to say, the prince of this world hath no hold on me. Indeed, the power of evil has nothing on us if we turn our backs on it. Let me just tell you right now, we are not Jesus. Jesus was able to do that to Satan because Jesus created everything. Jesus created Lucifer, who became Satan. Now, he didn't create him into Satan, but he created him as Lucifer the angel. Jesus created everything. That's why he was able, he was the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, all God, all man. That's why he was able to turn his back on Satan. Um, it, this, Michelle, this is a Agnes Sanford. She is the pioneer of inner healing. She is the root of inner healing. 
Speaking of early Christians, she says, Sadly, they postponed their glorious visions of a new heaven and a new earth. Sadly, they laid aside their hopes of being clothed upon with immortality and accepted death. Really? Hmm. She's, she calls Jesus the teacher who was a most profound psychologist. She said that our love is working in harmony with the laws of nature. She said on forgiveness, we merely permit him, Jesus, to carry on through us. We don't permit Jesus to do anything. We never permit him to do anything. He don't, that God doesn't need our permission to do anything. He is sovereign. And to say such a thing is to make God less than who he is. He is omnipotent, he is omnipresent, and he is omniscient. And he does not need our permission to do anything. And that's the problem, is that we have created in ourselves that we are gods. And that we tell God what to do. That we decree and declare and that we command and demand everything. And we don't. We need to remember who we are. We are created beings. And he does not need our permission to do anything. We are indeed made in his image and likeness. So again, some things she says sound good, but then when you start reading it, you're like, no. He is, first of all, a creator. Yes, he is. And so are we. No, we're not. The more we practice the work of creation, the more easily and naturally his power works through us. When ministering to a non-believing mother regarding her child, this is what she said to this mother. Make the picture of the child as you want her to be and say, my love brought this child into this world and through my own mother love, I recreate her after this image. What in the world? We learn, she said, we learn to cure our own diseased bodies by seeing in our own flesh God. Is anybody else bothered by this yet? When spilling boiling fat on her hand, she said, if I do not lose my temper, the hand is not burned. I am the boss inside of me. When near a snake while recalling a time outdoors, she talked of being conscious of her oneness with God and therefore with the snake. Do you know what that's called? That's called pantheism. That's the belief that God is in everything. That's what that is. That's pantheism. That is not scriptural. She said, God's light shines both within us and without us, and by learning to receive him within, we begin to perceive him without. She, during prayer, she prays for at one -ment. Do you know what that means? She broke up the word atonement into at dash one dash mint. During prayer, she prays for at one -ment with God or harmony. In order to make the sick mind well, the one who prays must believe unfalteringly that it will be well. The least shadow of doubt in his mind will blot out some of the sunlight of God's love. Where is this taught in scripture that, again, this whole concept, this is, again, when you're saying, oh, I have to speak this. My words have power. <sighs> no, they don't. <laughs> Not to what we're saying, they don't. We don't have the power to create, y'all. We don't have the power to speak things into existence. People are taking scripture out of context. Please hear me because I say these things again with love and compassion for people and sounding an alarm. Please, please pay attention to what you're listening to. People are being led astray by false doctrine and this is dangerous. This is opening yourself up to devils. This is opening yourself up to things that are not of God. When dealing with repentance, she instructs people, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> when dealing with repentance, she instructs people to prepare daily for confession. Now, she was an Episcopal, Episcopalian. She, <clears throat> so she believed in the confessional. She believed in the sacraments and things. She said, ask the Holy Spirit to throw the mind back into the nearest period and recall any unforgiven sins lingering in the subconscious. She likens them to splinters that may fester in the subconscious. Jesus saw that we need not only his teaching, but also his life. He tried, she said this, listen, I want you to listen to this. 
He tried Jesus. He tried saving people by his teachings alone, and it did not work. His principles were right, but they were continually short-circuited by the forces of evil in this world. God's love was blacked out from man by the negative thought vibrations of this sinful and suffering world. No, they were not. They were not. If I could... I, again, I cannot speak to Agnes Sanford because she's dead. And we cannot communicate with the dead. That's called necromancy and that's forbidden in scripture. But if I were to speak to Agnes Sanford or whoever believes this today, I would say no. It is not our vibrations that, block, that blackened out the love of God. It was our sin. It was our sin. Iris, I am reading from, I'm, <laughs> I don't believe this. This is from the healing light, Agnes Sanford, who is the, the pioneer and the root author of inner healing. That's who I'm reading from. I'm telling you all this so that way, no, she was not John Sanford's wife. Sanford, John Sanford is spelled with a D, S-A-N-D-F-O-R-D. Agnes had no D, it was S-A-N-F-O-R-D. But Agnes Sanford was John Sanford's mentor and she, and he acknowledges her in one of his inner healing books as the, he credits her with being a pioneer of inner healing. Um, she even prayed with him. He talks about this in one of his books. She prayed with him. Um, so I'm just sharing this with you so you can understand better and not be led astray. So um, let's see. So again, I, I, I was, I mean, I was already blown away when I was reading some of this stuff in this book, but um, Agnes Sanford, Carly, Agnes Sanford, she is the pioneer and the mother of inner healing. You need to stay away from it. Um, she said Jesus tried saving people by his teachings alone and it did not work. Then that makes God, Jesus, not God. And that his principles were right, but they were continually short-circuited by the forces of evil in this world. Where is that written? You're welcome. Our, she said our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane undertook the great work that we call the atonement. The at one which reunited man with God. He literally lowered his thought vibrations to the thought vibrations of humanity and received into himself man's thoughts of sin and sickness, pain and death. No, he did not. He was the propitiation for our sins. He was the spotless lamb. He was the lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. He took our sins upon him. He who became, he who knew no sin became sin. That doesn't mean he sinned. It means that he became the propitiation. He became the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Our sin was imputed to him. And in return, when we have faith in him through Jesus Christ, we are imputed righteousness. And we can only have it righteousness imputed to us by faith alone in Christ alone. Lord have mercy. Some who read this book may not be, she says this. Some who read this book may not be able to accept this chapter. If so, they would be wise to lay it on the table, as it were, and proceed with their methods of self-help until such time as they need a deeper power. You're going to find that when you read about Sozo that's on their website and other things, that there's always this, this talk of a religious spirit. <clears throat> And I want to tell you right now, there is no mention in scripture of a religious spirit. I understand that people can get wrapped up in legalism and stuff, guys, but we have created spirits that don't exist in scripture. We've told people they have an orphan spirit, that they have a Jezebel spirit, that they have all these spirits, and there's no mention of these spirits in scripture. None. Those people, there's, Jezebel did exist as a woman. Judas did exist as a man. But there is no mention of an orphan spirit, and it's basically contradictory as a Christian to say that as a Christian believer that you have a demon or you have an orphan spirit when Jesus himself said, I will not, I will not leave you as orphans. Please tell me why Jesus says in the scripture, I will not to the disciples, I will not leave you as orphans. So if he says that, then how can a believer have an orphan spirit? How can a true believer in Christ have an orphan spirit or water spirits? Please, somebody, please, can we please wake up from this, from, from Alice in Wonderland here and from this nonsense that's going on and all this, um, this new age hocus pocus that people are throwing around. And I'm going to tell you something right now. I used to, I, I was one of the people that used to say things that there was a Jezebel spirit. I used to say that there was a Leviathan spirit. I used to say people had a religious spirit and all this stuff. And God 
took mercy upon me and helped me to understand that what I was saying was not biblical. And thank God for his mercy and his grace and the truth of the word because John 8, 31, 32 of what Jesus told the people there. If you are my disciples, you will know the word. You will know the truth. You will walk in my word and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And Lisa, I didn't say, I said I wouldn't answer questions, but I'm gonna tell you here, what about The Authority of the Believer by John A. McMillan? Um, I have read that book and I would also... Um, <clears throat> drop a little bomb here for you too that Kenneth Hagin plagiarized most of that book from John A. McMillan. I have the original copy of it and I have the original copy of The Authority of the Believer which I was taught in Bible college under the ministry I used to sit under and that is false doctrine. He plagiarized the vast majority of that book from John A. McMillan, which that book was written in 1932 by John A. McMillan. The very first copy of The Authority of the Believer that was ever released by Kenneth Hagin was vastly plagiarized and he did it by, from John A. McMillan's book. He had to rewrite that book in 1985 because he was called out by it by a um, student at, OR, uh, at Oral Roberts University when they found out in the 1980s that he had plagiarized that book, and so he had to update it. The updated version is the one I was given when I was in Bible college. Yeah, it's amazing what you will begin to find out and you will and the things will start to unravel when you begin to start searching for the truth and the truth, thank God, will set you free. So thankful for the word of God that is the truth. It's the infallible word. <clears throat> so she, I do agree with her on this one. Some who read this book need to put it down on the table and proceed with their lives. Thank you. I will do that very thing. First, she says, first we create. Then we look at the created thing to see if it is good. And then we correct those things that can be improved. Even God checked up on his own creative work at regular intervals. Intervals. Really? Uh-uh. No. I'm not God. God did that, not me. Thank you. Let us tell him that we do not really... Un uh, here's another one to blow your mind. You ready? You might want to grab onto your seat for this one. Let us tell him that we do not really understand the need for Calvary and ask him to help us understand it. I understand the need for Calvary. I am a sinner saved by grace. And I am in desperate need of a Savior. And I, every hour I need him. Every hour I need him. And I thank God for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So thankful. It's okay, Lisa. You didn't, you didn't get it. I know you popped in. No problem. I just wanted to answer that question because that was another thing that was like an aha moment for me when I found that out. And also with Kenneth Hagin, he plagiarized um, a good deal of his books from uh, E.W. Kenyon. Um, so that's another, that's a whole other topic for another day. Um, I could I could fill you all in on some things I've discovered over the past year just from me doing due diligence of reading and trying to find things out. And these are not conspiracy theorists, theories either. I've actually done research and verified things that I heard. So, and I like to, I have copies of those books and I took time to read them and compare them and highlight them and make notes and I was blown away and I was upset because I thought, wow, this book has been plagiarized. Amazing. She said, if one wants to make sure that he will really receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ in this way, in confessional, he can ask a spiritual friend to pray for it to happen. No, we need, Jesus is the only mediator that we have. We don't need a sozo God or anybody else to guide us into being forgiven. We can go directly to Jesus, the mediator between us and the Father, and pray. Um, for the same reason that every Christian who believes in God does not receive healing, lack of faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have found only one way of praying for one another with real power while accomplishing an act of repentance. This is the ancient method of reparation, wherein one makes available the sacrificial love of Christ for another by assuming his sins and doing penance for them. We cannot take upon ourselves the sins of other people and do penance for them. That's what Christ did. And if we're saying that we can do that, then we make what Christ did invalid, void, and insufficient, period. And what Christ did on the cross is sufficient. It is all sufficient for dealing with sin. We repent of our sin. She talks of sending forth thoughts of power when talking of personal forgiveness before God. Uh, she says, so it is in the great world of prayer, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. This is this universalism. She says something else again in this book like this. 
this universal thought that all religions are under the same umbrella and they all go to the same God. That is false doctrine. And also there's this thing of ec uh, ecumenical, ecumenicism, ecumenical belief that all religions need to come together. That's a one world religion that many people talk of in the end times. We see this with the Roman Catholic Church wanting to come together with the Protestants and the Muslims and the Buddhists and everybody else wanting to come together. And that ain't going to work, guys, because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We don't need to be doing that stuff. We are to come out from among them. We are not to do that. He is the only way to the truth. And we say that not because we're arrogant, but we say that because we know the truth. And we want other people to know the truth, and we don't want them to be eternally damned and separated from, from God forever and be thrown into the lake of fire at the second judgment. <clears throat> Okay, um, she says, think of the Christ only as the Spirit of God. As Think of the Christ as only as the Spirit of God that abides in all of us and of Jesus. Now see, she's separating them. And of Jesus as the first demonstrator of that Spirit, we tend to become remote, vague, far away from man. This is Christ consciousness again. You cannot separate Jesus from Christ, and Christ is not Jesus' last name. The Christ on there was to let the Jewish people know, first and foremost, that he was the Messiah. He was the anointed one. This, absolutely, Aaron, this is another Jesus. She says, think of, I'm going to read it again. Think of the Christ as the only Spirit of God that abides in all of us, and of Jesus only as the first demonstrator of that Spirit. This is not biblical. This is why we don't need to be doing inner healing because this is the root of inner healing and this is not Jesus. This is another Jesus that cannot save you and you are, people are getting bewitched by this. She refers to Jesus as the man, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> she says, in order to, to fill ourselves with his whole being, let us think of him, imagining his presence, seeing him with the eyes of the mind, trying to love him with the heart. We are not to visualize Jesus. We are never told in scripture to visualize Jesus. Again, you are inviting something that you don't know is of Jesus. There is a testimony I read um, in some of these things that I was researching that someone was led through an inner healing session. And this person, thank God, had enough, uh, had was I guess, think was unctioned by the Holy Spirit, was a true believer that recognized that this was deception and said, they asked this, this spirit that came to them, this, this God or Jesus, whoever, they said, did Jesus come in the flesh? And kept pressing in that session and that this spirit or demon said no. So we know that this, just by that example, <clears throat> That was not of the Lord. Um, let's see. She says, The Spirit uses the path of the subconscious in sending forth the power of prayer. No. She says, And the Spirit within us knows when that world shall accomplish the thing, the word shall accomplish the thing whereto we send it, and shall not return to us void. She is quoting Isaiah 55, 11 there, and that is not our word that comes back null and void. That is the word of God. God's word comes back, not ours. She says, this then is the triple process for which we are called, reaching the white light of the creator God, finding the human loveliness of Jesus Christ, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, recreating man in the image of Christ through seeing Christ in man. This is indeed Christianity. No. Um, she says, we rise into the divinity of God through the humanity of Jesus. Speaking of Jesus, she says the redemption, that work of receiving into himself the spirits of men, purging them of their sins through his own suffering and rechanging them with the love of God. He uses every bit of help that we can give him for he needs us. No, he doesn't. He, we need him. We need him. Jesus does not need us. <laughs> we need him. How arrogant we've become that we think that, that we are so awesome and amazing and so necessary and essential. That's a, that's a word in this time. We think that we're so essential that God needs us. No, he loves us, but he doesn't need us. She says, how do you start a prayer group? People often ask me. I know of no other way of starting a prayer group except to make my own prayer so powerful that a group naturally grows up around me. Well, okay. 
She says to limit one's prayers for those in danger by the pious ejaculation. Yes, I said that. She said that in her book. She said by the pious ejaculation, thy will be done is merely to evade the responsibility. We can cause his will to be done concerning our loved ones. If we are willing to make the tremendous effort of being the conductors of love into the midst of hate, let us ascertain his will and do it. I can cause the will of God to happen? Really? Can someone point me to scripture on that? And tell me that I that you and I can cause the will of God to happen and thy will be done is merely to evade the responsibility? I would wonder if she would tell Jesus that when he prayed that in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, if it, if it be thy will, take this cup from me. Let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. <clears throat> During the Second World War, she said our parish did not lose one boy, either through illness or in battle. Praise God. If we had, I'm saying praise God, because that's amazing. It is new age, Sean, I agree. She said, if we had, I would not have said God failed me there. She said, I would have said God could not accomplish that through me because I was not a big enough channel. She said, I would have offered to God my grief at the death of one of his destroyed by man's wrong choosing of hate and violence and asked him to use that grief as an act of repentance for the sins of the world and as a bit of atonement for my share in those sins. Thus, by offering my grief to God for his own use, I would have turned it into power. Again, you're not a channel. That's a new age, that's a new age term. We are not channels. We are supposed to be disciples of Jesus Christ. We are to put on Christ. We are clothed in Christ. We are not to be channels. That is new age talk. And furthermore, we do not need to atone for the sins of the world. Jesus already did that. <laughs> Jen, this book is The Healing Light by Agnes Sanford. This woman is known as the pioneer and the mother of inner healing. We need to stay away from this. I'm, I'm probably getting myself in trouble with some people, but it's all right. Maybe it'll weed out some if, if, whatever. Or maybe it'll help. I, I, my point in here, I know I'm being facetious when I say some things and I'm coming off strong a little bit, but my point in this is I want to help people and I want to help other believers. I want the sheep to wake up, like the true sheep to wake up and to not follow. Get, you're, we're being led off a cliff by this stuff. We're being led off a cliff by hired handlings that they're probably they're in deception they don't even and they probably do some of these people probably do love the lord but they are in deception and they need to repent if they're doing this stuff because it's not biblical we need to love people enough to say the truth we tell we told people well you better not judge me you better not do that well read your bible because we are to judge in a righteous judgment and when we talk about you know jesus says you know take the speck out take the plank out of your own eye before you take the speck out of your net your brother's that's inferring that you need to deal with yourself first and then once you've dealt with yourself, then you can help your brother or sister in Christ. You don't leave them walking around with a speck in their eye after you've already had the plank taken out of your eye. And I'm telling you right now, I've had the plank taken out of my own eye. But some of this stuff. What do I think about people visiting heaven? I've read books about that as well. And they're contradictory, Sean, because nobody they don't agree. They don't agree. And I think that, you know, if you have three people... Real quick, you have three people in scripture. Sorry, there's a we're fixing the security alarm. I'm just reminding you. Okay, there are three people in scripture that talk of seeing into heaven. Stephen was one of them. He saw into heaven before he he died because of being stoned in the Book of Acts. John the Revelator, <clears throat> the revelation of Jesus Christ, he saw into heaven. And he wrote down everything. He didn't see a jello land like one person has said and all this silly stuff, jello land and all this craziness and, and big old rabbits painting Easter eggs. And you want to, I mean, really, there is a minister that has written books about those, about, about that very thing. That is not biblical, y'all. Mm -mm. So you have Stephen, you have John, and you had Paul. Paul in 2 Corinthians refers to himself in the second in the in the third person. Then I know a man, whether not in the body or in the body, I do not know that that was taken up into heaven uh, 14 years ago, and he saw things which man was not allowed to utter. He saw things that he could not even he was not permitted to speak of. So I don't know how these people are speaking of Jello Land and all this other stuff when you have men in the Bible that were not allowed, that were not permitted to say anything, or they were only permitted to say 
what was, uh, even John, when you read the book of Revelation, there were things that were revealed to him through uh, the thunders, I believe, and he was getting ready to write them down, and he was instructed um, either by an angel or by Jesus. Forgive me, I cannot remember. But he was instructed in Revelation, do not write these things down. Seal them to where they cannot be seen. And I'm paraphrasing. So <clears throat> I don't, li when I, people start saying stuff like that, I, I don't listen to them. I don't follow them. And, I, and I, it reminds me, it, it helps me to understand Romans 16 says, mark those, mark them who would bring division and teach you things contrary to the gospel. Teach you things contrary to the doctrine that is true. When I hear people say stuff like that, I mark them <laughs> um, as I don't need to listen to them. That's a false teacher. I need to pray for them. Pray that they will um, repent and that they will truly receive the tr tr truly receive uh, Jesus Christ, not the Christ, but truly receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I mark them and I say I'm not listening to them. Okay. Let's move on. I'm almost done with this first book, and then I have other quotes to read from this other one, and then we'll talk about a few scriptures and be done. <clears throat> Let's see, where am I at? Okay. She said, The world is so ordered that every person in it is inextricably bound up with the welfare of every other person. This is universalism, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Our thought vibrations are not limited by time or space. This is universalism, and it's not biblically based. She said, God works through my faith. He cannot send his power through much speaking or through frantic pleading, but only through faith. Then what is the point of prayer? She said, she talks of repenting and doing penance for a particular world leader and taking them to the cross of Christ and receiving for them forgiveness, healing, and life. Now, when she's saying this about this world leader, she's saying that she is uh, imagining this in her mind. No, no. She says, my own effective way of receiving Christ is at the communion service, for I have learned to receive him through the sacraments of the church as well as through my own meditation. She said, when enough of us have offered sacrifices, this is another one, and I was like, what? When enough of us have offered sacrifices like the priests of old in the name of the people for the world's sins, the pent-up current of the redemption of Jesus Christ will rush upon the minds of men and heal the soul sickness that breaks out in a rash of war. So we stand continually between the Redeemer and his people, channeling his love to them. That's word salad. When enough of us have offered sacrifices... Again, Jesus is the only mediator, and what Jesus did on the cross is sufficient. Mm. Okay, so that's all from this book, Agnes Sanford, The Healing Light. These are not things I hold to, guys. I do not believe this. This is, this is blasphemy. It is heretical. It is not a teaching we are to follow. This woman was the, the pioneer and the mother of inner healing. And... Again, I pray before she died that she found the true Jesus Christ, that she found Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior and repented of her sins and her false teaching. And these books are in, were in Christian bookstores, and I would not be surprised if they were in still in Christian bookstores, and they have no business being in Christian bookstores because they're not biblical. Please stay away from inner healing. Stay away from sozo. Stay away from inner healing. Stay away from theophostic prayer. Please, because it is all rooted in this woman's beliefs. And again, she dabbled in the Tao, the force, which is a Chinese um, belief. She went to a Buddhist temple and prayed to Buddha when she was little. She admitted that she possibly had demons when she was little, that she admitted she possibly had de devils cast out of her. She battled with all kinds of things for years and, and then said that it, you know, because she imagined it in her mind that she was, that she was able to be free. Jesus is the only one who can set us free. And it doesn't, again, it doesn't mean that we're not going to go through things on this earth. We are going to face things. Jesus promised us that we would. We are going to face trial and tribulation. We are going to face things in our bodies. We are going to face things. We are going to have uh, mental, we're going to battle things in our minds and such. But we must come back to the word of God as the foundation of the truth. And we come back to what scripture says about things. And we don't have to visualize Jesus. We don't have to go up the Father's ladder. We don't have to go through four doors. We don't have to, you know, do all this craziness. We don't have to have divine editing, which is what so, part of what Sozo teaches is their advanced teaching. We don't have to do this stuff. It's works-based, and plus it's, it's not scriptural. 
And if we have to continue to do these things, then we're saying that what Jesus did is not sufficient. So now I'm going to read some of, again, this other book by Agnes Sanford. I'm going to read some of the things that she said, The Healing Gifts of the Spirit. And if you think that the healing light was a bit disturbing, just wait till you hear some of the stuff that comes out of this book. <clears throat> and then I'm going to read some scripture to you to help you understand that you don't need to be, you don't need to be seeking after the inner healing. Okay? And turn to Jesus Christ. Don't visualize him. Don't imagine him in your mind. Don't create a picture of him or anything like that. You need to get in the word. You need to feed on the word and you need to read the word in context and you need to shut all this other stuff off. Hey, Kimberly. Yeah, just teaching some false stuff. That's what I'm doing. Okay. Get myself in trouble. The Healing Gifts of the Spirit. This is out of her book, Agnes Sanford, The Mother of Inner Healing. I keep saying that because people are coming on. I don't want them to think that I believe this gobbledygook. She says, there was a time when I was so that there was a time when I so envisioned God and felt vaguely apologetic at the efforts of man, often crude and distressful, to improve upon God's creation. But now I know that God wants man to improve upon his creation. Man's work upon this earth is merely the continuation of the plan of God, wherein nothing remains unchanged, but all grows and develops from one stage to another. Indeed, it seems at times as though God rested from his work of creation after he made man, waiting and watching to see how man would get on with it. And then she quoted Genesis 2, 2, where God rested on the seventh day. Um, she says, it is the very plan and intention of God then that man created upon this earth shall continue to create. That is not why, G, what God, why God rested. He rested because on the seventh day, what he had done was perfect. He did not rest on the seventh day so he could sit back and go, okay, man, it's your turn. Now you get to create all, all this stuff. Mm -mm. She said, the Lord has therefore guided me to a broader and more subtle way of prayer. It baffles me in a way because I cannot tell what my spirit does and whither it goes. But it does travel, and that God does work through my spiritual body, even when my mind is quite unaware of it, becomes more and more apparent. Therefore, simply call in your mind to me or to someone else as a human channel for the love of Christ. This is describing astral projection. And this is my thought on this. This is what I'm telling you. This is describing astral projection and is voiding Jesus, again, as our one and only mediator. She's telling people when they read this book, the healing gifts of the Spirit. She's telling people, simply call in your mind to me or to someone else as a human channel for the love of Christ. No, I will not. Thank you very much. She says, those who walk in darkness will understand the simple directions given in the preceding chapter, or even if they do not understand, will still be willing to try them. Well, there is a reason for that, that they will understand them because they are lost and they do not realize that what they are reading is lies and deception. She said, but some of you who read this book may be wondering, why don't these people in trouble simply go to Jesus Christ? Or should they not receive their help directly from him instead of from trees and birds and playing the piano and carpentry? Of course they should if they were well enough in soul. These people cannot go to Jesus unless you carry them into his presence. The best they can do without a healer is to find peace through the silent voices of the stars and of the stones and of the humble grass and the small creatures that live in it and to find life through creating life by God's help with any tool that is theirs to use, their ability to sing or to polish furniture, to plant flowers or to plan businesses. Jesus said that he came to those who are sick and in need, not the well. That's my note at the end. Yeah, exactly, Kim. What? That is, again, pantheism because you're saying, oh, God is in everything. I can find God in the grass, in the snakes, uh, like she said in the last book, that she, that she was conscious of God um, when she was outside with a snake. Um, that you can find God in the stones and the stars. No. God's, that's, that's pantheism, and that's not biblically based. Again, Agnes Sanford, mother of inner healing. Stay away from this. From this. Please, I am, I'm sincerely, I'm... <sighs> she says, ministers particularly love to say, God can help you. Please do not say it. No matter how sincere you are, it sounds to the other person like the hackneyed professional approach which they have come to distrust because for years they have cried out for God to help them and he has not done so. Say, I can help you. 
You do not at this moment have time to be humble. True humility consists in any case in caring so much for another that you do not think of yourself at all. And the question of whether or not you are speaking with due modesty simply does not enter your mind. The moment one considers one's own humility, one is not humble. Yeah. Okay. She says, nothing in my life has been of more value than this weaving of the words of life into my subconscious. She says, when applying for prayer, when applying for prayer of faith, she stated that for every cell in the body has a rudimentary mind and will hear your words. Huh? Every cell in your body has a rudimentary mind and will hear your words? What? Oh, my word. She, when speaking of being healed from headaches herself, Agnes said that the headaches were not completely healed until years later when the memories were healed. She tells of making pictures in her imagination of the thing you purpose in prayer. And this is a cultic practice again. This is a cultic and it's new age. It's new thought. It's new thought. Um, new thought is actually, um, and the metaphysics is what uh, word of faith is, is steeped in and rooted in. For indeed, the healing spirit of God is in the wind and the sun and in the little creeping things upon the earth and is most certainly available to the one who prays with faith, be he minister or layman, man, woman, or child. Again, pantheism, God's in everything. Not biblical, y'all. When speaking of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a power, an energy, the water of life. And when that power is not, I'm sorry for the faces. I need to fix my face sometimes. I have to remind myself because I don't hide things very well. And when that power is not given forth to the whole congregation from whence the group sprang, when that energy is not used to awaken life within the body of Christ, when the water of life is kept and hoarded rather than being freely expended. See, she's using words that sound like they're biblical, but they're not. When the water stagnates, the energy is turned off, the power dwindles. Well, last time I checked, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He ain't an energy and he ain't a power and he ain't a vibration either. And this is putting the power in our grasp and diminishing the, diminishing the sovereignty and the omnipotence of God. I'm telling you, y'all need to be aware. Agnes Sanford, inner healing. Stay away from it. Stay like more than six feet away from it. I mean like spiritual distance this thing from, you, from it. Don't even social distance, like spiritual distance yourself from it because it is dangerous stuff. I'm tell, I sat... I sat reading these two books, and when I, I had to put them down sometimes because I would get so angry reading these books. I would get so bothered by reading them, and I thought, no, i got to finish them because I really feel this unction and pressure that I need to be telling people the truth. But I would sit and read these books, and I would have my mouth open half the time going, did she really just say that? And she's saying that she's a Christian? And then these people, like there's endorsements on the back. It says, a book which belongs in the personal library of every concerned Christian who wants to make fuller use of his or her latent spiritual powers and opportunities? No! And if I wasn't using it for research purposes, I'd set fire to these things. When in prayer corporately, after praying for the minister and for God to bring forth the highest potential of his being, this is what she prayed for a minister when it was coming into a service. She prayed and to, for God to bring forth the highest potential of his being. She said, next, we looked about the church to see whether there was anyone there whose face made us feel uncomfortable. In other words, anyone whom we did not like, of whom we disapproved, who had hurt us or who disapproved of us. Here comes that. Well, you got a religious spirit. You can't receive this. you got a religious spirit. That's what that religious spirit does is that they mistake grace and they put on their offense hat. No, I know the truth now. The truth has set me free. Mm -mm. She said, who had hurt us or disapproved of us. And we prayed for that one. We did not deny that person's faults. We redeemed them through prayer. You redeemed them through prayer. Mm, no, you did not. We ask the love of Christ to come into us and go, and go through us into this person. Healing the memories and bringing forth all that was good and lovely in his nature. Then we gave thanks as one does in the prayer of faith and with inspired imagination. We made in the mind a picture of that person transformed into the image of his real Christ self. And we rejoiced that this was so. I don't drink tea, but I'm sipping my my water that has some raspberry lemon or strawberry lemonade flavoring to it. I'll just sip it for a second. 
I don't do tea, but I, I can do this. When applying the gift of knowledge and praying for someone, she writes out a prayer and she says, read this over in silence and then read it um, aloud. As you read, pretend that you are not hearing the words from your own lips, but from mine. Not mine as a human being, but mine as a spiritual being whose spiritual body, uh, whose spiritual body God can use as a trained channel for the healing of the soul. And she wrote out a prayer um, on pages 120 through 123. And I'm not going to read it just for time because I've got several other things to cover before we can get done. But she talks about going, uh, asking God to go through the, the all, open all the windows and let the fresh wind of the Spirit um, go through all the the, uh, the rooms of this person's uh, body and cleanse them. That's, again, that's like doing the sozo stuff. They go through all the rooms and they tell you that I uh, ask... Uh, uh, to forgive so and so and to cut to cover it with the blood of Jesus and all these things again these are not biblical scriptural teachings um hey Nina good to see you and actually um well I don't know if I should say this but um there are certain ministries I can no longer um follow I can no longer I find myself now that I know things I can no longer participate in and Bethel was one of those ministries. I'll just be honest with you. Bethel was one of those ministries. I had loved their. I used to love their music. I was a worship leader. I used to sing their music. Um, I used. To, I used to love listening to Bill Johnson's teachings. I used to eat them up. I had books of his. I can't do that anymore, y'all. I can't because I can't even listen to their music anymore. Because if I listen to their music, then I'm affirming what they teach and what they believe. And their music is a gateway to get in and to to get involved in their ministry. They teach sozo. I can't do this. I can't be, I cannot be a part of that. And there was something, I'll get to this real fast and I need to get back on this. I cannot listen to Bethel anymore. I can't listen. There's certain ministries I just, I will not listen to anymore. And if you can get offended at me for saying that, and that's fine, and I love you. But I'm just telling you, you need to pay attention because there's stuff going around that I, that I think the sheep are actually waking up. And I'm not saying that in an arrogant way because I was being led astray. But I can't listen to them anymore. Because I start to hear things now that, hey, Roxy, that are not scripturally based. And I pray for them. I don't want them. I don't wish anything ill on them, but I can't listen to them anymore. And there was something recently I saw, and you all may, to, may not have seen this, but they actually did a service in June of last month to address racism and things like that. Again, I'm not against. I understand it's a whole other topic. I know there's racism. I know there's all this stuff, but there's a lot of divisiveness going on that, that, that should not be so. And I have a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ that are of every color and every creed, and I love every one of them, and they love me, okay? But I saw in this service that at the end of it, they were decreeing and declaring an end to racism. Well, racism's still here because guess what? Racism is steeped. I can't listen to Hillsong anymore either, John. I'm, I just can't. There are certain things I've seen and heard. I just can't do it. Again, I pray for those people, but I just can't do it. And, the, and that was really hard because that was stuff I used to love to listen to. I loved listening to their music and stuff. And then I did a major purge when I, Hey, good to see you. Um, good to see you, Tamika. I love you, my sister in Christ. Um, and I miss seeing you guys. So, um, I can't listen to this stuff anymore. And one of the things, um, yes, yep, yep, yep. Aaron, that's what I was getting to. Um, recently, June 12th, they did a service for the, for, uh, for all that. And at the end, um, they did this, um, this ritual, that's the best way I can explain it, where they took a staff that looked like a wizard staff from the Lord of the Rings and they were actually quoting Gandalf from the Lord of the Rings. And they were utilizing that and saying to racism, thou shalt not pass. They were quoting and exegeting a movie, guys, from Lord of the Rings in their in their service. And, they're, and, Bill, and all of them are standing up there. Cheon, Bill... Uh, uh, Bill Johnson, several of them are holding this staff. It's a, it looks like a wizard staff. You're quoting a wizard. That's witchcraft. And you're doing that on a platform in the name of Jesus Christ. And you can say whatever you want. That stuff is not, we are not to redeem that. That is not redeemable. That is witchcraft. And we have no place adopting that stuff. Come out from among them. Do you realize that that ministry has a book called The Physics of Heaven? I've read that book twice, and I have it on my shelf right now as research. Do you know what that book has in it? It has a bunch of New Age and occultic practices in it. 
It talks about these vibrations. It talks about the sounds and the atmospheres. It talks about all this stuff, and it's called the physics of heaven. The physics of heaven. Um, I would get up, but I won't right now. Maybe that'll be another topic for another day. Um, I'm telling you, there are things that are masquerading as light, and it is dangerous. And this inner healing, this she is the root of inner healing. There is no other way to get around this. She is the root of inner healing. And I love you enough to tell you that. Sozo is rooted in inner is rooted in Agnes Sanford. Theophostic prayer is rooted in Agnes Sanford. She is known as the mother of inner healing. And this woman wrote these books, and she was the one that introduced inner healing to several ministers. And now it's rampant. What Jesus did on the cross is sufficient. It's sufficient. <laughs> okay. In her chapter on the healing of memory, she refers to the book of Common Prayer and the Exhortations, which is used by the Episcopal Church, and she also refers to the confessional. She states that the most important duty of the priest is to pronounce the absolution, to say that by his authority as a priest, the authority handed down all the way from Peter, that he announces the absolution and remission of all the sins of the penitent. There's no need for that. We can go directly to Jesus Christ. We do, again, we don't need to do this. We don't we can go to people and say can you know, confess our sins to one another. We're supposed to do that. That's a biblical thing. But we don't need another mediator. We don't need to pray to anybody else but Jesus. He is the mediator between us and the Father. He brought the ministry of reconciliation. When she prayed for people, she prayed for the love of Christ to come into that one and forgive the sins and heal the sorrows of the past as well as the present. The little child who used to be as well as the grown person who is now. She says, I begin at the present and go back through the memories. Mentioning, excuse me, every sin and every grievous incident that has been told me. Indeed, I go farther back than this and pray for the healing of the impressions of fear or anger that came upon the infant far beyond the reach of memory. I carry this prayer back to the time of birth and even before birth. How are you going to do that? And pray for the restoration of the soul, for the healing of the soul, the psyche of the real originated person. Oh, of Christ, she says, our Lord, when he took our sins and sorrows into himself, made the connection with all of us. He became forever a part of the mass mind of the race so that even though his living being is now in heaven at the right hand of the Father, a part of his consciousness is forever bound up with the deep mind of man for this healing of memories is redemption. How? Please help me. Please help me understand how this how this is leading people to the true Christ. I know that people are not going to like this. I get that. I get it. There were things, when I first started coming out of certain things that were deception, I didn't like hearing it either. It made me angry. And there were things that I defended to the to tooth and nail. I defended stuff. I defended ministers that I sat under for years and didn't realize that I was sitting under deception, sitting under people that were not operating in the true spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, that had another agenda. I defended things tooth and nail that I should have woke up. And it, thank God, after 18 years, I woke up. Better late than never. <laughs> and I've done much repenting. Much, much repenting. And not I'm not saying that in a boastful, prideful way. That is, It is very humbling and embarrassing to admit some of the things I did. I, I taught people how to activate the prophesy. Do you know that that's not even biblical? You can't activate someone to prophesy. That is as the Spirit wills. That's according to the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians. If you read your scripture, if you read the Bible, it does not tell you that you can activate people. We've got people paying other people to activate them in things that they don't realize that they're sitting under deception every single day. And they're seeking an experience and they're not repenting and they're falling on their knees before the Lord, Jesus Christ. And they're not just wanting simple devotion unto God. <laughs> oh. 
She says in the healing of the memories, the one who prays relives it for him in the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ with a pain that is brief because the Lord turns it into peace and possibly with tears of compassion but not of heartbreak. And since the Spirit transcends time, there is no need for months of beating one's breast and reliving old sorrows. Well, then what is the point of inner healing? That seems very contradictory, that last statement. There's no need for months of beating one's breast and reliving old sorrows. Then what is the point of inner healing if that's not the case? What is the point? Because I know of people that have gone through inner healing and then every several years they're like, well, I have to have another inner healing. Why? Why? <laughs> I, I don't get it. Maybe I'm missing something. No, I'm not missing anything because, the, the, again, the truth has set me, set me free. Thank God. Thank God. Oh, okay. Of Christ, she said, he it is who once descended into hell and who therefore is quite at home in the deepest hell of our being. Okay, that's, an, again, a whole other topic for another day about some people teaching that doctrine that, that Jesus went into hell. Um, there are even people that teach. Um, Hagen taught this. Copeland teaches this. Um, I have heard audio teachings of this, that Jesus went into hell and that he had, had that he went as a, he had to be born again and that he, um, that he suffered and was tormented. Nowhere in scripture does it tell us that. And again, when you study hell, there's a difference between, um, there, Sheol, Hades, Abraham's bosom, all that stuff. Again, that's a whole other teaching, a whole other day. Um, but that stems from this. Um, she says, when retelling the story of a priest, she said the priest did not really believe in the forgiveness of sins, which is really the healing of the memories. That is not true. The forgiveness of sins is us repenting before God and receiving his propitiation for our sins, the atonement for our sins, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. When speaking to others about the healing of memory, she said, I often say afterwards, but you know, that this is not your real self at all. And I describe the picture of the real self that God has helped me to work out of my creative imagination. We are not told to use our imagination in scripture. Mm -mm, no, we're not. That's not, no. Regarding the work of the Holy Spirit, she said she describes the joy of the Lord, the gifts of peace, and the gift of truth. She compares them to three primary colors, red, blue, and yellow, and she said, when these three colors are combined in perfect purity, then they resolve into the white light of creativity. The mother of inner healing, the source of inner healing, said this. If the root system is bad, then the fruit is not going to be good. So there is no way to reconcile this. The root of this is bad. That means that the fruit that comes from it, it's not going to be of God. There's no way to reconcile and justify this. If you know this now, and now you know it. Now you know the truth of all this. Where this is coming from. Of Christ, she stated, Jesus Christ, the concentration into spiritual visibility of the transcendent light of God, further concentrated and limited his being and became man. He took into heaven his acquired manhood so that a man forever sits upon the throne of heaven. And being man, he took us in a mysterious sense with him. A certain emanation or an invisible and personalized energy of our spirits has already ascended with him into the heavens. This is describing another Christ. Again, this is this whole thing of kenosis. This is another Bethel teaching. They teach this based on Philippians 2, that God, that Jesus emptied himself of his divinity. That's not what that means. Because if he ceases being God for one minute, he's not God. God cannot cease to be God for one second. Not one second can he cease to be God. And I imagine God the Father, this is her saying this, and I imagine God the Father receiving us again into himself and making therefore a new merger of God and man, a new sending forth of the original spirit of God, in penetrating the redeemed spirit of man in a new way. When speaking of herself and friends praying together, she said, God gave us a sign, a deep burning within the head, as though a spiritual power were awakening even the physical channel of brain cells, nerves, glands, whatever they might be, through which our power would increase. Uh, several more, and then we'll be, I promise you. Thank you guys for sticking with me. I know this is long, but there's a lot of stuff here that I want to share with you guys. Um... There's some really disturbing stuff I'll tell you here in just a second. More disturbing than this. Um, she said, well, just as disturbing. 
Um, let's see. Da, da, da. She said that when we can, we can enter into the accumulated thought vibrations of the ages. Now catch this. And feel the feelings and think the thoughts of someone who lived long ago. Many take this as proof of reincarnation, but I do not so consider it. We do not need to live again and again in time, for we live presently in all time if we did but know it. <sighs> the vistas of prayer that this opens stagger the imagination. Can we send our prayer power back through time? Is this what Jesus did when he descended into hell and prayed for the spirits who were in prison in the time of Noah? Is this to come down to something near to our experience, the explanation of the prayer for the healing of the memories? How much greater we are than we have ever known. Uh-huh. The unconscious mind of man does not live alone. There is a mysterious connection between the unconscious being of one person and the deep mind of another. Moreover, this connection can reach back through time and forward through time and can make rapport with the thinking of someone who lived long ago or of someone who has not yet come upon this earth. What in the world? What in the world? Sorry, it's freezing up. I don't know what's going on. Let's see. Let me know if it's back or not. Let me know, let me know. Yeah, that's crazy. That you can, yeah, that's necromancy, Sean, you're right. We cannot communicate with people that are dead. We, we're not, we're, we're told not to do that. The unconscious mind of man does not live alone. There is a mysterious connection between the unconscious mind of one person and the deep mind of another. Moreover, this connection can reach back through time forward and, and can make report the thinking of someone who lived long ago. We read that. Um, she talks of contemplative prayer. Um, again, that's something that you need to be leery of. Um, this is indeed the purpose of all contemplative prayer, to be immersed in God, <coughs> even to the exclusion of words. The conscious mind tries in every way possible to stop this, whether from the interference of the perverse principle within us or from the control habit of the conscious mind. I do not know. We feel moved to pray for someone. We should rebuke that impulse and set it aside. Yes, it is good to do intercession, but not now. This is our daily meeting time with God. We may be guided to look up Bible verses. Let us close our minds so that, to that impulse. It is good to seek guidance in the Holy Scriptures, but not now. Uh-huh. In talking about the discerning of spirits, she quotes the words of an unnamed minister to a friend. Hey, good. I'm glad I'm back. Uh, I was just talking about how she talks about contemplative prayer. Um, that she talks about that, you know, if you get the impulse to pray for someone, you need to shut that down. That's your time to meet with God. If you have the impulse to read your Bible, you need to shut that down. Um, again, no, that's not, that's not biblically based. Um, in talking about the discerning of spirits, she quotes the words of an unnamed minister to a friend. <clears throat> Again, this is Agnes Sanford. She wrote The Healing Light. These are only a few books. I'm quoting from this book that she wrote, The Healing Gifts of the Spirit. She is the mother of inner healing. Stay away from it. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just giving you some godly advice. Stay away from it. She said this minister said to a friend, of course, God can work through benign spirits and souls of the departed through mediumship to effect some cures. But that does not ipso facto justify mediumship, even if it is benign. Hey, Billy, this is Agnes Sanford, who is the mother and the pioneer of inner healing. Dangerous stuff. Of course, God works through angels and saints, but we are to contact deliberately only one departed person. This is her saying this. Or she's quoting this minister that said this to a friend. We are, only, we are to contact deliberately only one departed person. The Lord Jesus Christ. Really? He's departed? I thought he was alive. Resurrected. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, she said, he is the only departed one who has been perfectly here. So even though we contact a very benign person on the other side, we get defiled to the extent of his or her imperfection. Oh, my word. Okay, two more. When she discerned spirits and prayed for others, this, she stated that she directed this departed thing into the hands of Christ who will know how to deal with it. Again, listen to this. I do not condemn or hate it, 
for there may be something in it which can be saved. <laughs> and if by chance they are not evil, but only lost ones, and if you send them forth not in anger, but into the hands of Christ, then you know not work, you know not work you may be accomplishing in the unseen as well as the seen. You being in the flesh and adhering bravely to it, desiring not to see or to hear that which is forbidden, nevertheless may release into the hands of the Lord some lost and wandering soul who is held to the psyche of a living person in a vain attempt there to find life. Where is this in scripture? Nowhere. Other departed souls do not inhabit the, the bodies of other people. And again, the root of inner healing is from this woman. If the root system's bad, the fruit cannot be good. It doesn't matter. You can argue till you're blue in the face. The fruit cannot be good if the root system is, is diseased from the beginning. And lastly, she said of Peter walking on water, she said he no doubt was upheld by the same principle of levitation that Jesus himself knew how to use. Okay, so I said I, I shared all that. <laughs> I have to laugh from not crying because it's so sad. So I shared all of this with you to just, oh my God, help, help us all. Um, so I shared all that because, and I had been really debating on doing a video like this for months, for, for quite some time. When I first started reading these books, um, when I started searching for truth and really wanting to understand what the truth was, because I had been so entrenched in some of this stuff. Um, I was not super entrenched in inner healing and things, but I was familiar with inner healing. Um, and I'd heard of Sozo and stuff, but there were other things I was entrenched in, in the charismatic church. Um, <clears throat> and I, I will tell you this, there were things I believe, I was in deception with things, things I believed. With some things I believed, I was, I was in serious deception. And it all unraveled the day that I sat under a teaching and I heard scripture being misquoted and twisted to manipulate and control people. When I heard a minister say to people during an offering time um, about listening and obeying and railing for 10 minutes that had nothing to do with offering, about sons and daughters listening and obeying and then quoting Jesus and basically saying, you know, Jesus said, if you, uh, if you, uh, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments and applying that to spiritual sons and daughters, obeying spiritual fathers, I immediately, it was like I jolted awake and God was able to get a hold of me like a sheep and shake me for a second and go, what are you sitting under? Like I sat there and thought to myself, what am I sitting under? 18 years I've sat under this. What am I sitting under? And then for those that know what happened and things, that... <laughs> Didn't, it didn't end well. Uh, and so I thought. Um, now I understand that it was the best thing that happened to me um, because it woke me up and got me out of deception. And now, um, yeah, Sean, you remember that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so it was that moment that I sat, I heard that, that that was my awakening moment. Um, and I realized I was walking off a cliff. And... Um, Unfortunately, when you start asking questions or you start questioning teaching and things like that um, of apostles, from what I found, um, you start being made an example of. <clears throat> and you start getting your title stripped away and you start getting uh, told that you're operating in witchcraft and all kinds of other stuff and uh, you're slandered. And so um, lots of other things happen to you. And it was in that moment that I woke up and I realized that I was in deception and that um, I needed to find out the truth, and I repented uh, before the Lord and um, suffered for quite some time um, because of my decisions. Um, <clears throat> I can't blame anybody else for that. That was my decision to sit under that and to follow deception and never question what I was taught. That's, that's my responsibility. I can't blame anybody else for that. Um, I can't, that can't get sozoed out of me or anything else like that. I suffered. 
Um, and there are people on here that understand that all too well, that suffering. Um, but I am thankful for that suffering because I am walking in the truth now. And now I'm in a place where I don't care who I offend. I don't, and I'm saying that in love. I'm not trying to go out and offend people, but I don't care anymore about if people get angry with me, if they get upset with me, I'm going to preach Christ and Christ crucified. I am going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to preach truth. And if my followers dwindle because on my blog, if um, I don't sell my books that I write or whatever, because I'm working on some other books right now, that matters not to me. What I care about is being able to stand before my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. And I don't care what I lose in the process because I have lost a lot. I have lost a lot. And I didn't realize that it was all gain. That loss that I suffered, it was all gain. It was all gain to really know Jesus Christ and to not continue to be deceived. And now there is such a that burden on me to preach the truth and to tell people the truth. And I want you to understand there were things, I mean, I've studied stuff for over a year now. There's things I looked into. There's things I can't do anymore. I can't, you know, um, <laughs> I, I was, uh, many people don't know this. I'm just telling you a few, a little bit of this. And then there's a few scriptures I want to share with you. And again, I'm so sorry. This is long. I was lined up to actually help with, um, the Bible study of the Passion Translation. Um, and that never came to fruition, but they were, I was in contact to help, to potentially be considered to help work on the Bible studies for the Passion Translation. Um, and I loved reading that book. I, lo I mean, I loved reading the Passion Translation. And after I researched that, I can't even read that anymore. Because I've... I realized that there was such there was such deception in that I couldn't even there are things that I've had it I'm telling you guys it there was something that it just God just turned me upside down last year and I thought I'm going to die I felt like I was dying last year and then it was like I was dying but I was truly learning how to live free in Christ and not trying to be somebody and not trying to um, get climb the, the ministry ladder and and not trying to, to please man and and follow all this false this false doctrine and all these mirages all these things um, and so my whole world got turned upside down and so now I'm walking in the truth and there are things even today um, that I'm having to undo and I find myself even there's times I want to go back to certain things I used to do and I can't do it I mean I just can't because now I know the truth <laughs> and some people will say well you're being religious well um, this word right here what Jesus Christ did for me and the foundation of this word saved it saved my life and he saved my soul from deception and darkness and I pray for those that I sat under I pray for them. I pray mercy for them. Um, I, I pray that God would wake them up. I do. But I share this with you because after reading these books, there is no way for me to deny that what this teaching is of inner healing, the root system of it is bad. And again, I say this again. If the root system is bad, the there is no way for f good fruit really to come from this. And people are going to say, well, you know, but, but I got healing when I did, when I got sozoed or I had this happen or this, this thing happen. And I would just tell you, please test the spirits. We are told that in first John four, we are told in first Thessalonians to test everything. We are not to blindly eat everything that we're offered. Test this word, read these. If you can, separate the truth from if you can read these books and again i'm not saying i'm i'm infallible if you can read these books read stuff like this if you can read the physics of heaven that bethel put out if you can sit there and read it and be and 
and righteously judge it in accordance with Scripture and not be biased and say, well, I love Bethel. I, I can't separate myself from them. You have to be willing as a Christian, as a disciple and follower of Jesus Christ, you have to be willing to ask the, the tough questions. You have to be willing to test things. And if you're not willing to test things, you're going to get deceived. I'm telling you from experience. So I urge you to test these things. These things I've shared with you, this is not biblically based. It's not founded in truth. It's, it's not. You cannot tell me that this woman was demonstrates that she was truly saved in these books. You just can't. Because no one is going to sit there in these books and say, well, God vibrations and thought vibrations and that we can repent for someone else's sins and that we can lead people, we can imagine people to the cross of Christ and that we can imagine Jesus and that he can come into all the rooms of our of our body and our soul and open the doors to them and clean them all out and that we can that Jesus is going to come in a vision that he's going to say he's sorry. He's going to say he's Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the son of the living God is going to come to you. And honestly, you're going to sit there and tell me that he's going to apologize to you. He has nothing to apologize for. To apologize means that he sinned. He is not going to apologize. We make ourselves higher than God. In the book of Psalms, it says that we make the mistake of thinking that he is like us. He doesn't think like us. His ways are higher than our ways. And it is arrogant for us to think that we know better than God and that we are higher than God and that we're little gods and all this other stuff. And we're, we're sitting and we're feeding on this stuff and we're amening it and we're saying, preach it, come on, do this, do that. Shoo, I feel the fire of God. You better test what you're feeling because it may not be what, I don't want that type of fire. And usually when fire is talking about New Testament, I'll just tell you right now, people will say, I want the Holy Ghost fire. Do you realize that, that, when fire is mentioned, it's really talking about judgment. I don't want that. I want to be refined. I want, I want, the, I want to be refined. But to think that I, I know better than God and that he needs to apologize to me or that I need to forgive him. I have seen videos of people that have been sozo that said, I, I, I forgave God. What do you need to forgive God for? What do you need to forgive God for? Exactly, Jenny, I agree. Strange fire. So I urge you um, to test these things in accordance with Scripture. Do not be deceived. And some Scriptures to ponder on, um, for one thing, in Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 19 and 20. Um, I want you to read that, but Ezekiel 18 basically is laying out the fact that we are responsible for our own trespasses, our own transgressions, our own sins. Um, and Ezekiel 18, 19 and 20 is a great passage to look at excuse me, read all of chapter 18. I encourage you when you read the Bible, don't just listen to a verse that some minister tells you and think that that's what it is. Oh yeah, fire tunnels. I used to participate in fire tunnels. I used to be part of the people that laid hands on people for fire tunnels. I won't do that anymore. I will never do that again because that is not biblical. You won't find fire tunnels in, and listen, I'm embarrassed. I'm telling you, I'm embarrassed to say that I participated in that. You may not, you may be like, well, she, she's void of the spirit by saying that. Well, sorry, but I, I won't ever participate in stuff like that ever again. No, because that's not, there's nowhere in scripture it tells us to do that. Nowhere. But um, our moral choices determine our actions and responsibility falls on us. We are responsible for our own sins. Nobody else is. We are responsible for that. Okay. And this makes it plain. Ezekiel 18, 19, and 20, it makes it plain that the son is not going to pay for the iniquity of the father and vice versa. The father is not going to pay for the iniquity of the son. We are responsible for our own sins. We cannot repent for another's sins. I cannot repent for my ancestors. You can't repent for your ancestors, okay? This whole stuff that's even going on in the world right now of saying that we have to repent for, for our, for our ancestors, we can't even do that. But we can repent for our own actions, our own hatred, our own sins. You understand what I'm saying? We're, I mean, some of us as Christians, I've been guilty of this. We do things and we don't even test it to see, is this biblical? Um, there is no biblical precedence that any prophet or apostle in the Bible dealt with inner healing in their personal lives, nor taught that this is necessary in the life of believers. You going to tell me? 
that Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians 12, when he, 11, when he's laying out all the things that he went through, he was shipwrecked, he was stoned. You're going to tell me that he needed to be sozoed? He never mentions that. In fact, in Philippians chapter 3, <clears throat> Philippi, let's read a few and then we're going to be done. Philippians 3, he talks about, um, he says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, which is obtaining the resurrection, the perfection in Christ. Uh, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. This whole focus of inner healing and sozo and theophostic prayer, and whatever else it's called, it's all focusing on the past. It's all focusing on, well, you have to do this right. You have to do, you have to do this. You have to do that. I've had someone tell me, and they say this in sozo, if you, hear, if you audibly hear the voice of God, then you know you're saved. That is bull. That is absolute bull baloney because you don't know if that voice you're hearing is the voice of God or you're entertaining a demonic entity that is not a surefire way to know that you're saved the scripture makes it plain and I had, nowhere does it tell us that we audibly have to hear the voice of God in order to be saved when we hear the word of God preached which the word of God is Jesus Christ made manifest in the flesh as all God and all man, when we receive the word of the, the pre the gospel of Jesus Christ preached, when we hear that and we believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, we are saved. There's no biblical precedence that the apostles um, and the prophet said, well, I have to be sozo. Well, I have to have inner healing. Well, I have to go back and before I was even born, uh, my, the infant, hey, Marlo, the infant, my infant self needs to be uh, healed of old wounds. No, it's called sin. <coughs> and you're not going to escape that until you leave this earth, until you die. Because our flesh is hostile to the things of the spirit. And spirits hostile to the things of flesh. It, it battles. There's a battle going on there that many of us don't want to admit is going on. But it's there. You're not battling devils all the time. Stop saying that. There's not a devil around every tree. Yes, there are demons. I get that. But we are negating the fact that we, can, we are battling our flesh. We have sinful desires, all of us do, that we're trying to fulfill. And we have to put our flesh under. We have to die daily. Paul talked about that. I die daily. He talked about, I do things that I don't want to do, and I, I don't do things that I do want to do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who is going, who's going to save me? And he, he confesses about the Lord Jesus Christ saving him, <clears throat> redeeming him. 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8 is another one to look at. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, very famous passage of Scripture. Very famous passage of Scripture. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. Why are we still focusing on the old things? And I get it, guys. I get it. I had stuff happen in my childhood. I had stuff happen in my life that was very hard and very difficult. I'm not saying you don't have emotions, that you be a robot. We have to deal with this stuff and contend with these things. But that doesn't mean that you have to sit in a session and you need to have some sort of guide as your other mediator, apart from Jesus Christ, lead you in a visualization and addressing thought vibrations and negative memories for you to be whole. You need to turn to the Word of God and you need to turn to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and trust in Him. And realize, that, I mean, there's things that happened in my past that were awful. And I can look at them now and think, well, God was able to turn that around for the good. 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. We forgive others because the Lord has forgiven us. Amen, John. We do not need to forgive God, and he does not need to apologize us. God is incapable of sin or trespasses. We are to ask God to forgive us of sin and trespasses that are ultimately against him. That's Colossians 3, 13. Um, <clears throat> is another good passage to look at for that, that we forgive others. Um. Colossians 3, 13. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Um, 
And the last thing is we do not, we do not give Jesus permission to do anything. He is God. He's not just a man. He's not, it's not Jesus sitting up in heaven and then the Christ is still down here. Is Jesus Christ. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, he doesn't need our permission. He commands our, our obedience. As disciples and followers of Jesus Christ, Jesus commands our obedience. He doesn't need our permission. He doesn't need us. <laughs> we are in desperate need of him. Okay? Now, that was long, and I'm real sorry, but there was a lot to cover with that. I understand that people are going to probably be upset with me. Um, it's okay. It's all right. <laughs> um, I love everybody that's tuned in. I appreciate you taking time to listen. Um, if you're catching the replay, thank you. It's going to be long, but I encourage you just to, uh, well, you're already at the end of it. Um, I, but I appreciate you guys taking the time to listen. <clears throat> I hope that you will really weigh this out. If you've, um, if you still feel strongly towards inner healing, I ask that you would please test this um, and make sure that what you're doing is you're following Christ and that we're not listening, we're not getting our ears tickled, that we're not having an itch scratched. <clears throat> um, that's my concern. I don't want to see people fall away. And there's a great falling away that's happening right now. And the Bible tells us about that. The Bible doesn't talk, doesn't promise a, a great revival. It doesn't promise a billion soul harvest as we've been hearing for decades from proclaimed prophets and such. It doesn't promise that, but it does promise a great falling away. Um, and if anything, I want to be a voice right now that's preaching the gospel, preaching truth, and warning people um, come out from among them get away from this stuff get away from it get run as fast run away from it get away as fast as you can from it um, <clears throat> so thank you again for your time um, I'm gonna go get me something to drink because now I talk so much my voice is kind of but um I look forward to being on here again sometime I'm sure I'll share other things too that will probably stir the pot but it's good it gives it challenges us it, this stuff challenged me and I really had to look at some things um, and if you have questions please feel free to message me um, um, that's it I'll catch you guys later again have a great Saturday <laughs>